Not long ago, I released an episode where I focused on an extraterrestrial or interdimensional entity by the name of Lamb that infamous British occultist Alistair Crowley had claimed to have contacted while living in a New York apartment with his then scarlet woman, Roddy Minor. This led a longtime friend and listener to suggest that I do an episode in which I further explore Crowley's time in New York. And that's going to be the focus of this episode. And I should note that some years ago, I did a very lengthy documentary episode on Crowley's life as a whole, and if memory serves, I do cover some of his time in New York in that one as well. Years prior to his extended stay in New York, Crowley had passed through briefly en route to Mexico. The following is from his Confessions, full title The Confessions of Aleister Crowley, an auto-hagiography. Summer was now at hand, and the wanderlust reasserted itself in me. There was no point in going back to Boleskine till the following Easter. Boleskine being the notorious manor house on the southeast side of Loch Ness, which Crowley had purchased. As it happened, Mathers, McGregor Mathers, a fellow member and Crowley superior in the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, to whom I returned to report progress, had two guests, members of the Order. They had just come back from Mexico. The fancy took me to go there. I wanted in particular to climb the great volcanoes, so late in June 1900 I sailed for New York. I think it was on the 6th of July that I reached New York. In those days, one was not bored by people who had never seen a real skyline boasting of the outrage since perpetrated by the insects. A mountain skyline is nearly always noble and beautiful, being the result of natural forces acting uniformly and in conformity with law. Thus, though it is not designed, it is the embodiment of the principles which are inherent in design. New York, on the other hand, has been thrown up by a series of disconnected accidents. The vanity of the natives led them, therefore, to concentrate their enthusiasm on a rejected statue of commerce intended for the Suez Canal. This they had purchased at second hand and grand eloquently labeled Liberty Enlightening the World. They had been prophetic enough to put it on an island with its back to the mainland. But in those days, the spirit of liberty was still intensely alive in the United States. The least sensitive visitor was bound to become aware of it in a few hours. There was no genteel servility. Nobody interfered with anyone else's business or permitted busybodies to meddle with his. The people seemed prosperous and contented. They had not yet been forbidden to amuse themselves when the day's work was over. And here Crowley, an Englishman, complains about the heat he encountered. Till this time I had never been in any reputedly hot country. I was appalled to find New York intolerable. I filled a cold bath and got in and out at intervals till eleven at night, when I crawled panting through the roasting streets, and consumed ice water, iced watermelon, ice cream, and iced coffee. Good God, I said to myself, and this is merely New York, what must Mexico be like? I suppose that I was experiencing normal conditions, whereas in point of fact, I had landed at the climax of a heat wave, which killed about a hundred people a day while it lasted. I only stayed in New York two or three days, and then traveled direct to Mexico City. Crowley's family owned a successful brewing company called Crowley's Alton Ales. This had allowed his father to retire early, and upon his death, leave his son a sizable fortune, a fortune which the adult Alistair squandered, leaving him struggling financially. By 1914, Crowley was reduced to relying on donations from membership dues from AA and OTO members, the AA being an esoteric order founded by Crowley. 
the name of which has a variety of interpretations, but one of the more common is that it's an abbreviation for Argentium Astrum, or Astron Argon, both meaning silver star. The OTO, or Ordo Templi Orientis, being another magical order or secret society, one which Crowley had quickly climbed the ranks of, two years after his initiation, he had been granted control of the organization in England and Ireland, and given the title of Supreme and Holy King of Ireland, Iona, and all the Britons, within the Sanctuary of Gnosis. In July of 1914, Crowley, a skilled and accomplished mountain climber, went climbing in the Swiss Alps. During this period, the First World War had broken out. After recuperating from a bout of phlebitis that same year, Crowley set sail for the States aboard the famed British ocean liner, the RMS Lusitania, arriving in New York in October. He moved into a hotel and began earning money writing for the American edition of Vanity Fair and taking on freelance jobs, including writing for famed astrologer Evangeline Adams. In the following from the Confessions, Crowley details leaving England for the U.S. and arranging to sell off some rare books and manuscripts for an infusion of much-needed cash. I had a feeling that my country, the richest in the world, would shortly be going cap in hand to the savages for calories. I went to America by the Lusitania on October 24th, 1914, expecting to stay a fortnight in return with the sinews of war. It did not take me 48 hours to discover that my egg was addled. I had taken with me the equivalent of about 50 pounds in American coinage. As luck would have it, one of the first people I met in New York, Mr. D., whom I knew as a collector of rare books, paintings, and sculptures, including some of my own and Travabla publications, showed an interest in the purchase of some of my unique editions and manuscripts. I arranged to stay in New York until these could be sent over for his approval. As a matter of fact, I had understood him as offering to purchase them all outright. Money was at this time of considerable moment to me. In the upshot, he purchased between seven and eight hundred dollars worth of my goods, instead of between three and four thousand dollars worth, as I had expected. And this disappointment left me in great straits financially, as I had at the time no immediately available resources in England. While researching this episode, I repeatedly encountered the claim that in his diaries Crowley writes about continuing his experimentation with sex magic while in New York City via Cover Your Ears, masturbation and engaging in sex acts with female prostitutes and male clients of Turkish bathhouses. Being familiar with Crowley, I have no trouble believing this, but I just wanted to add the caveat that after scouring his books, The Confessions, The Magical Diaries, and Diary of a Drug Fiend, I couldn't find a specific passage that clearly recounts any of this, but I could have simply missed it, or maybe the passage or passages in question are in other diaries, be they published or unpublished, that I'm unaware of. But I do know for Crowley that engaging in masturbation as well as performing other sexual acts was a standard part of the practice of ritual sex magic. The closest thing I found regarding frequenting Turkish bathhouses in New York is the following from the Confessions once again. It's relatively tame and seems to contain only passing innuendo at best. It was on October 2nd, 1919 that I first attained to this Pisgah site of the Promised Land, Pari Nibbana, Nibbana, I believe, being the Pali version of the word, the Buddhist word Nirvana. I was spending the night in Fleischmann's Turkish baths in New York. It was my custom in all such places to practice the tenth clause of my vow as a master of the temple to interpret every phenomenon as a particular dealing of God with my soul, 
by forcing advertisements and other public announcements to yield some spiritual significance, I would either apply the Kabbalah to the words and manipulate the numbers so as to reach a state of mind in which some truth might suddenly spring in the silence, or I would play upon the words as if they were oracles, or else force the filthy falsehoods of fraudulent dollar dervishes to transfigure themselves at the touch of my talisman into mysterious messages from the masters. And I thought I had a knack for alliteration, albeit in my case usually unintentional. I did also find the following quote spoken by an actor portraying Crowley in a biographical documentary on YouTube that looks like something that probably originally aired on British television. They don't mention where the quote comes from, but it's much more salacious and on point. It very closely echoes the claims I came across online. I continued my studies on the ninth degree, using a number of prostitutes for the purpose of magical assistance. I was also in the course of my experimentation, sodomized by two strangers in a Turkish bathhouse, and performed a small favor for another all done in the course of magical experimentation, I would rarely indulge in sex for mere pleasure. Even in death, Crowley remains perhaps one of the most controversial figures of all time, and usually when we think of the controversy surrounding him, his involvement in magic and the occult probably come to mind. But during his time in New York, Crowley also managed to spark political controversy that would see him branded a traitor back home. As mentioned previously, the First World War had broken out. Crowley, far removed in New York, took to referring to himself as an Englishman of Irish ancestry who opposed British imperialism and thusly sympathized with the German war effort. In January of 1915, Crowley had made the acquaintance of one George Sylvester Verrick, an American poet and writer working for the German Office of Propaganda in America. Verrick hired Crowley to write for the propagandist paper The Fatherland, and albeit later, to edit another publication called The International. Crowley, writing under his own name as well as several aliases including the Master Therion, Baphomet, and Lord Boleskin, wrote a number of anti-British articles as well as articles on magic. In one article, he wryly lamented that a German bombing raid had missed his aunt's house and requested that Count Zeppelin try again providing her exact address. He also praised the unrestricted use of submarine warfare on Allied shipping. On July 3rd of 1915, along with Lila Waddle, an Australian violinist who was then Crowley's Scarlet Woman, and had followed him to America, Crowley gave an anti-British speech at the foot of the Statue of Liberty and pretended to tear up his British passport. As stated previously, Crowley's actions were considered treasonous back home, and as a part of their investigation, the authorities raided the London headquarters of the OTO. Crowley, in response, tried to spin the situation, attempting to paint himself as something of a double agent, secretly trying to undermine the German war effort or propaganda machine from within. The following is from the Confessions once again, and it deals with Crowley's supposed intentions and his thoughts or view on German culture. I found myself then in New York, awaiting the arrival of my books and manuscripts, an event unfortunately as I then thought long delayed. So I bethought me whether I could not irrationally, immorally, unphilosophically, with a game leg but with all my heart and brain serve England. I was furious at the stupidity of the British propaganda. It was worse in America than it had been in England. At its best, it was an exaggeration and sheer falsehood, so transparent that Woodrow Wilson himself, to say nothing of a legion of Italian bootblacks, saw through it. As for the German propaganda, it was hardly noticeable. 
Was it that they did not understand the importance of America in the Wilhelmstrasse? Was it that they had the good sense to rely upon the stupidity of the English apologists to defeat their intentions? I had a considerable opinion of the intelligence of Germans, dating from the time in my boyhood when Helmholtz was the great name in physics, Haeckel in biology, Mommsen in history, Goethe in poetry, Bach, Beethoven, and Wagner in music, the time when one might say that the whole of organic chemistry had been developed in Germany. I had further to remember that the German social system was considered by nearly all thinking Englishmen as a sublime model. German thought and action had been made immortal by Carlyle. German social economy had been slavishly adopted by Lloyd George in the Insurance Act. Great lawyers like Lord Haldane and talented errand boys like H.G. Wells mingled their voices, of course in the latter case with a somewhat cockney accent, to extol the greatness of Germany and to hold her up as a pattern to all good Englishmen. I reflected that Bismarck was not exactly a fool in politics, that von Moltke had been hardly an amateur in the art of war. I had read von Bernhardi with admiration, both for his intellectual ability and his moral simplicity. I did not argue whether or not he came from Italian stock. Nietzsche, or Nietzsche, was to me almost an avatar of Thoth the god of wisdom, and whether or not he was a Polish Jew, Germany had possessed sufficient intelligence to profit by the thwackings that he gave her. Yes, I was almost convinced that the German directorate had decided to allow British hypocrisy and stupidity to win their battles for them by making themselves absurd and obscene in the eyes of all sensible people. And I should add that I don't think it's known for certain whether or not Nietzsche had any Jewish ancestry, not that it should matter. He was German but of Polish ancestry, and his father was a pastor and he was raised Christian. Despite his work being co-opted by the Nazis, I believe it's thought he was both anti-anti-Semitism and he was also anti-nationalism. His sister, on the other hand, was a raging anti-Semite. But I'll continue reading from the Confessions. One day, I think early in 1915, I was seated on the top of what the American purist calls a stage, and we a bus. This vehicle was proceeding, or attempting to proceed, up Fifth Avenue, which is a sort of ditch lined with diamonds, and over rouge stenographers, all at a price totally disproportionate to the value of the article. I was not interested in these objects of merchandise. I was occupied by my own vanity. Somebody in England had sent me press cuttings, which described me as the greatest poet, philosopher, blackguard, mountaineer, magician, degenerate, and saint of all time. And I was thinking that, as in the case of the Queen of Sheba, when she visited King Solomon, the half had not been told. I was aroused from this mood of mingled gratification and disappointment by a tap on the shoulder. A voice asked me to excuse its intrusion. Its owner explained that seeing me reading cuttings with the superscription of a London firm, he assumed me to be at least English-speaking, in a city where Yiddish was the language of romance. If so, was I in favor of a square deal for Germany and Austria? I replied that I was. I have often thought how much nicer Germans and Austrians would be if they were cut up into little squares and made into soup. I did not reveal to my interlocutor this interpretation of my reply, for at my initiation I was taught to be cautious. He, with the frank bonhomie of the Irishman, told me that his name was O'Brien, that he had to get off at 37th Street, but that if I could accept his card, he would be pleased to hold further conversation with me at his office. Like Jürgen in the masterpiece of James Branch Cabell, I am willing to taste any drink once, and I may incidentally remind my admirers that, if the drink should be Curvoisier over fifty years old, I will go on till something breaks, and do good work all the time. 
so I went to see Mr. O'Brien. Mr. O'Brien was not in. I think I never saw him again. But I discovered that his office was the office of a paper called The Fatherland, appearing weekly. To my surprise, the inmates seemed to know all about me, and in the absence of Mr. O'Brien, they produced the most extraordinary little amniote, half rat, half rabbit if I am any zoologist at all, whose name is Joseph Bernard Rethy. I looked at this specimen of the handiwork of the creator, with somewhat mixed feelings, gradually sagging towards a pessimistic atheism, especially when I learned that, like anyone in New York who can string together a dozen words without sound or sense, he was a shining light of the poetry society. But he is quite a nice boy. And Crowley goes on to describe how he was sized up by this Rethy character as quote-unquote meat for his master, who he was then introduced to. To my surprise, this master of his recognized me and came forward with extended hands, bulging eyes and the kind of mouth which seemed to have been an unfortunate afterthought. The name of this person was George Sylvester Verrick. And Crowley goes on for quite a while, so I'll jump down a bit for the sake of brevity. His intelligence was not sufficiently subtle to comprehend the moral paradox in myself. I praise Germany. I sympathize with Germany. I justify Germany. And he erroneously deduced, as the average Englishman might have done, that I was pro-German. He did not understand the attitude which I held. I can hardly blame him for it would puzzle myself if I allowed myself to worry about it. I may or may not be a burglar, but even if I am, I am going to drill a hole through the householder who interrupts me in the exercise of my profession. This is my position, but Vera could not guess it. I might be a high-souled cosmopolitan like Romain Rowland. I might be an Irish fanatic like Roger Caseman. I might be a sordid traitor like Mata Hari. But he could not understand my being sincere in thinking like Bernard Shaw would think if he could think, and equally so in acting like Sir Edward Grey would act if he could act. During the conversation, it dawned upon my dull mind that here were the headquarters of the German propaganda. And I'll jump down once again. But I am overrunning myself. My immediate problem was to confirm Verrick in his conviction that I was a pro-German. There was a very serious snag in the English Review for November 1914. There was a poem of mine called An Appeal to the American Republic inviting an Anglo-American alliance. This poem having been written in 1898, I had had to alter the traitor Russian to the traitor Prussian to suit the political kaleidoscope. Fortunately, I had no difficulty in persuading Verrick that this action was in the nature of camouflage, designed to exploit the stupidity of the British public in general, and Austin Harrison in particular. His knowing Mr. Austin Harrison made this easier, but personally I was so terribly English. My accent betrayed me as did Peter. My clothes were obviously Savile Row. I had not even taken the precaution to be sufficiently un-English to pay for them. I clutched at the straw of my name. From the myths of antiquity looms a phantom Crowley somewhere near Kilkenny, where the cats come from. And though my particular Crowleys have been mercifully well-behaved in England, since the bishop of that name who published his naughty epigrams in the time of Queen Elizabeth, there are lots of Crowleys in America who come direct from Ireland. I found Verrick very sympathetic about Irish independence, and I billed myself as the only and original Sinn Féinor. My trouble was that I knew nothing about the Irish question, and possessed nothing by the hazy idea common to most Englishmen, including those who have studied Ireland most profoundly, that it was a devil of a mess and a devil of a nuisance. However, Verrick wanted to believe, and he believed, like a Catholic who is afraid to sleep in the dark. And just a warning, it does continue. Having thus established myself as an Irish rebel in a pro-German, I went away and considered what I could do about it. 
I read the fatherland. I found the German case presented with learning, with logic, with moderation. The motifs were scholarship, statistics, and statesmanlike sobriety. It seemed to me that in the peculiar temper of the United States, whose people, however ignorant and dishonest individually, are always as a whole curiously anxious to know the truth and to do justice, this propaganda was infernally dangerous to British interests. I talked to my friends about it. All they could say was that Varick was personally despicable. Some, like Captain Gaunt, which sounds like a really lame supervillain, affected to ignore the importance of the fatherland. Others, even more hopeless from my point of view, seemed to think that they could suppress the fatherland by continuing their lifelong policy of omitting to invite Varick to dinner parties, which would have bored him and given him indigestion. I decided on a course of action which seemed to me the only one possible in a situation which I regarded as immensely serious. I would write for the fatherland. By doing so, I should cut myself off temporarily from all my friends, from all sources of income. I should apparently dishonor a name which I considered it my destiny to make immortal and I should have to associate on terms of friendship with people whose very physical appearance came near to reproducing in me the possibly beneficial results of crossing the channel with a choppy sea. But the German propaganda was being done as well as the British propaganda ill. With a little moral ascendancy over Varick, I could spoil his game completely by doing as much mischief to Germany as the Patriot Bottomley and the other horse-throated fishwives of Fleet Street were doing to England. I met with more success than I had hoped. And here's some more from the Confessions. And this is where he recounts the incident with Lila Waddle I previously mentioned, and also expounds some more on his supposed role as a double agent. I invited a young lady violinist, who has some Irish blood in her, behind the more evident stigmata of the ornithorhynchus and the wombat. I believe that's a dig at her being Australian, adding to our number about four other debauched persons, on the verge of delirium tremens. We went out in a motorboat before dawn on the 3rd of July to the rejected statue of commerce for the Suez Canal, which Americans fondly supposed to be liberty enlightening the world. There I read my Declaration of Independence. I threw an old envelope into the bay, pretending that it was my British passport. We hoisted the Irish flag. The violinist played the wearing of the green. The crews of the interned German ships cheered us all the way up the Hudson, probably because they estimated the degree of our intoxication with scientific precision. Finally, we went to Jack's for breakfast and home to sleep it off. The New York Times gave us three columns, and Virick was distinctly friendly. Over in England, there was consternation. I cannot think what happened to their sense of humor. To pretend to take it seriously was natural enough in New York, where everybody is afraid of the Irish, not knowing what they may do next. But London was having bombs dropped on it. There was, however, one person in England who knew me. Also a joke when he saw it. The Honorable A.B., my old friend aforesaid, Owing to the confusion inevitably attached to the mud with which we always begin muddling through, this gentleman had been inadvertently assigned to the intelligence department. When he saw the report in the New York Times, he wrote to me about it. I knew he would not talk. I knew he would not blunder. I wrote back explaining my position, which he immediately understood and approved. But intelligence such as his is a rare accident in an intelligence department. He could not authorize me to go ahead without appealing to his superiors. He put the case before them. They were quite unable to understand that I was merely in a position to get into the full confidence of the Germans if I had the right sort of assistance. They idiotically assumed that I already possessed a knowledge of the enemy's secrets, and they sent me a test question. 
on a matter of no importance, did I know who, if anybody, was passing under the name of so-and-so. I was not going to risk my precarious position asking questions. The official English idea of a secret agent seemed to be that he should act like a newspaper reporter. The result was that the negotiations came to very little, though I turned in reports from time to time. There was a temporary gentleman named, and here it looks like Crowley omits the full name, in the British military mission, with whom I had such dealings as is possible with the half-witted. He thought that he detected hostility in my attitude towards him, whereas it was merely the university manner. It was this poor thing whom our Secret Service sent to interview me. I told him that I could find out exactly what the Germans were doing in America. I also told him that I had the absolute confidence, years old, of a man high in the German Secret Service, that I could go to Germany in the character of an Irish patriot and report on the conditions of the country. He continues on for quite a while regarding his role in the propaganda war, but I don't want to spend an inordinate amount of time on this one aspect of uh, Crowley's time in New York. Crowley would return to New York, but he briefly left to tour the West Coast with Gene Robert Foster, a poet and fellow occultist from the Adirondack Mountains. Although I'm not sure if she had already made their acquaintance by this point, it's interesting to note that Jean Robert Foster had befriended a number of prominent artists and authors slash poets of the day, including Ezra Pound and W.B. Yeats. A disciple of Crowley, she was given the magical name Sister Hilarion. In Vancouver, the home of North America's OTO headquarters, Crowley met with Charles Stansfeld Jones and Wilfred Talbot Smith to discuss the propagation of Crowley's religious system, Thelema, on the continent. Jones was a Canadian occultist, member of Crowley's AA, and the chief organizer of the OTO in British Columbia. Talbot Smith was an English-born ceremonial magician and Thelemite, who was introduced to Crowley's writings through Jones. Like Jones, he also belonged to both the AA and the OTO. In Detroit, Crowley tried peyote extract at Park Davis. If you're like me, you might be thinking that Park Davis is some area like a national park. No, turns out it's the name of what was once the oldest and largest drug company in the United States. They had been researching and distributing peyote as a treatment for a number of ailments or medical conditions since at least the late 19th century. They still exist, but they're no longer an independently owned company. They're now a subsidiary of Pfizer. Crowley also visited Seattle, San Francisco, Santa Cruz, Los Angeles, San Diego, the border city of Tijuana, and lastly the Grand Canyon before ultimately returning to New York. In 1916, I believe it was, Crowley met a man by the name of Ananda Kumaraswamy, originally from Ceylon, now Sri Lanka. Kumaraswamy was a historian, metaphysician, and a philosopher of Indian art, credited with playing a large role in introducing Indian art to the West. At the time Crowley befriended Kumaraswamy, the later was on his second of four wives, a musical performer born in Sheffield, England by the name of Alice Richardson, who went by the stage name Ratan Devi. The following is, you guessed it, from the confessions. The next act was the appearance of Ananda K. Kumaraswamy, the Eurasian critic of religion and art, with his wife, Ratan Devi, a musician from Yorkshire, who had fallen in love with him and filched him from his first wife. He soon got sick of her and took refuge in India, but finding it a continual nuisance to have to send her supplies, wrote her to join him. It had been suggested with the secret hope that the climate would rid him of his incubus. She made the journey in charge of his best friend, a wealthy Punjabi, whom she promptly seduced. And I should stop to mention, if you haven't picked up on it by now, that Crowley has a way of speaking derisively of others in general, but also of people of other races and ethnicities. So please remember as I read from the confessions, his words, not mine. But I'll continue. After a series of violent scenes in Bombay, 
The half-breed accepted the situation, and all three traveled together for some time in the hills. Rattan Devi possessed a strange seductive beauty and charm, but above all, an ear so accurate and a voice so perfectly trained that she was able to sing Indian music, which is characterized by half and quarter tones, imperceptible to most European ears. His idea was to bring her out to New York. He introduced himself to me knowing my reputation on Asiatic religions and magic. I invited them to dine and to pass the evening at my apartment, so that she might sing to the tambora her repertoire of Kashmiri and other Indian songs. I was charmed and promised to do all I could to make her a success. I introduced them to several influential people and wrote a prose poem about her singing for Vanity Fair. She and I lost no time about falling in love. This suited her husband perfectly. The high cost of living was bad enough without having to pay for one's wife's dinner. All he asked was that I should introduce him to a girl who would be his mistress while costing him nothing. I was only too happy to oblige, as I happened to know a girl with a fancy for weird adventures. He was anxious to rid himself of even theoretical responsibilities and therefore proposed a divorce. I agreed with a yawn. Details never interest me. Meanwhile, she had made her debut and scored a superb success. This had never occurred to her husband, who, being unable to appreciate her supreme art, hardly took her singing seriously. In fact, her success was largely due to my assistance. I taught her how to let her genius loose at the critical moment. However, to her husband, only one thing mattered at all. There might be money in her. Right about face, he wriggled out of the divorce on various puerile pretexts and then pulled out the pathetic stuff and pleaded with her to come back to him. She was the only woman he had ever loved, etc., ad nauseum. These maneuvers were conducted at the top of their voices, it was a series of scolding matches and epileptic fits. I had a gorgeous time. What annoyed them both more than anything was my utter indifference to the whole affair. My position was that if she chose to live with me, she could. When she wanted to get out, there was the door wide open. But I wouldn't lift a finger for any purpose whatever. The situation was complicated by her becoming pregnant. This changed my attitude. I still refused to interfere with her will, but now I was prepared to make any sacrifice necessary to ensure her welfare and that of our child. She was making quite a lot of money by now, so he pestered her day and night. Whenever he could spare a moment from the German prostitute with whom he was now living, having been thrown out by my eccentric friend. And this is an oddly worded sentence. I checked two different copies of the confessions to make sure it wasn't a grammatical or editing error occurring in one version and not the other, but it was the same in both. He had queer ideas, had the eminent mongrel, okay, the cost of a double room being slightly less than that of two single, he affected a prudent economy by putting this girl in the same bed with his wife when he was out of town. During this time, I was often away in Washington, thus missing a good deal of the fun. In June, I came back proposing to spend the summer in a cottage by Lake Pasquani. Rattan Devi was one of those women whose chief pleasure is to show her power over men. She tried it on me, but a bath brick would have done quite as well. Convinced after many desperate efforts that I would not run after her or even walk her way, she began to understand true love, to recognize me as her master and quit playing the fool. She did not divine that my Gibraltar firmness was calculated policy. I really loved her and knew that the only hope of making her love me was to kill the vanity which prevented her from being true to herself in giving her whole heart. Before I left for New Hampshire, we had a farewell meeting. She was now too far advanced in gestation to appear in public, so her husband had persuaded her to go to England for the confinement and also to make various necessary arrangements with regard to the future. 
He had now cunningly pretended to give way about the divorce, admitting my right to my child and its mother. His real motive was very different. She was a particularly bad sailor. During a previous pregnancy, she had been obliged to break the journey to save her life. She was in fact on the brink of death when they carried her ashore, and she lay for weeks so ill that a breath of wind might have blown her away. It was at least not a bad bet that the Atlantic voyage would end in the same or even more fortunate way. I still refused to put pressure upon her. I said, here's my address. You're welcome whenever you like to come, and I love you and will serve you with every ounce of my strength. I went off in a few days she joined me. The peace and beauty and solitude renewed the rapture of our love. Oh, this is gay. I never thought. I'd be complaining about Alistair Crowley getting sappy. I had given... I'm supposed to be serious. This is supposed to be a documentary episode. I shall continue. I had given my word to do nothing to hold her, and after a few days, she decided to go to England. Her children needed her. It was her peculiar perversity to be at one time the artist absolute, at another the mother and no more. And the trouble was that whenever common sense wanted her to be the one, she invariably assumed the personality of the other. So now, just because I represented art, music, and love, her troll tugged at her to be maternal. Off she went. The Eurasian's calculations were not far wrong. The voyage caused a miscarriage, and she lay between life and death for over six weeks. Needless to say, the moment the mischief was done, she repented bitterly. When she returned to America, I was in New Orleans. She implored me to come back to her. She wrote once, and often twice, and every day, each averaging a dozen pages. There were also telegrams. I replied with immovable firmness. You insisted on going away, with the result of killing our baby. I love you and I'll take you back, but on this condition, that you make a clean break with the past. Her unhappy temperament kept her at war with herself. She wanted to have her cake and eat it as well. She wouldn't burn her bridges. I maintained firm correctness, and it all came to nothing. My heart is still not wholly healed, but I relieved myself of part of my pain by using the whole story exact in every detail as the background of my Simon If yarn, Not Good Enough, The International, January 1918. I made one change, Kumaraswami, Haranzada Swami, Haranzada being the Hindustani word for bastard. The publication of this tale came as a slight shock to the self-complacency of the scoundrel. As alluded to in the Confessions, in the summer of 1916, Crowley took a quote-unquote great magical retirement in New Hampshire. The following, once again, is from the Confessions. I was thus able to undertake a great magical retirement in June. For this purpose, I went to live in a cottage on the shores of Lake Pasquani in New Hampshire. My initiation now took on a more strictly magical character. I was able to enter into direct communication with the realities of existence instead of conducting them by means of symbolic gestures. The cottage Crowley references was owned by the aforementioned astrologer Evangeline Adams. Before leaving New York for New Hampshire, Crowley had apparently prepared and taken a certain substance, most likely a drug that some speculate may have been some sort of amphetamine. Just before leaving New York, I had prepared by this method an elixir whose virtue should be to restore youth. And of this, I had taken seven doses. Nothing particular happened at first, and it never occurred to me that it might be imprudent to continue. I was mistaken. Hardly had I reached my hermitage before I was suddenly seized with an attack of youth in its acutest form. All mental activity became distasteful. I turned into a mere vehicle of physical energy. I could hardly bring myself to read a book, even of the lightest kind, 
I could not satisfy my instincts by paddling the canoe which I had imported. I spent about an hour every day in housework and cooking. The remaining fifteen hours of waking life were filled by passionately swinging an axe without interruption. I could hardly stop to smoke a pipe. There was no self-delusion about this, as I might have persuaded myself to believe in the absence of external evidence. But this was furnished by an irrefutable monument. I wanted to build a wharf for my canoe. With this object, I cut down a tree and trimmed a 22-foot log. As an animal lover, I was somewhat disturbed to learn that, during this time, according to his own writings, Crowley had crucified a toad. Supposedly, it was part of a ritual involved in consecrating a temple of sorts in the woods. One might wonder if perhaps Crowley simply had too much time on his hands. In order to erect the temple of the new Aeon, it appeared necessary to make a thorough clearance of the rubbish of its ruined predecessors. I therefore planned and executed a magical operation to banish the quote-unquote dying god. I had written in the wizard way. He had crucified a toad in the basilisk abode, and now I did so. The theory of the operation was to identify the toad with the dying god and slay it. At the same time, I caused the elemental spirit of the slain reptile to serve me. The result was immediately apparent. A girl of the village, three miles away, asked me to employ her as my secretary. I had no intention of doing any literary work, but as soon as I set eyes on her, I recognized that she had been sent for a purpose, for she exactly resembled the aforesaid toad. I therefore engaged her to come out every morning and take dictation. It was apparently at this time that Crowley wrote his work, The Gospel According to St. Bernard Shaw, and as you might guess, the following is from the Confessions. I had with me a copy of Bernard Shaw's Androcles and the Lion, and bethought myself that I would criticize the preface. The almost unparalleled knowledge of the text of the Bible, which I had acquired in early childhood, was shocked by Shaw's outrageously arbitrary selection of the texts that sustained his argument. His ignorance of Asiatic life and thought had led him into the most grotesque misapprehensions. I set out to criticize his essay, section by section, but the work grew under my hand and in three weeks or so I had produced a formidable treatise of some 45,000 words. I had intended to confine myself to destructive criticism of my author, but as I went on, my analysis of the text of the Gospels revealed the mystery of their composition. It became clear both those who believe in the historicity of Jesus, and Jesus is in quotes, and their opponents were at fault, I could not doubt that actual incidents and genuine sayings in the life of a real man formed part of the structure. The truth was that scraps of several such men, distinct from and incompatible with each other, had been pitchforked together and labeled with a single name. It was exactly the case of the students who stuck together various parts of various insects and asked their professor, What kind of a bug is this? Gentlemen, he replied, this is a humbug. And so Crowley seems to be suggesting that Jesus may have been some kind of composite figure. But it continues, in writing this book, I was much assisted by Fraser's Golden Bow. And I have to stop for a moment. I'm also a fan of The Golden Bow, which I learned about by reading a biography on Jim Morrison. Jim Morrison was a, a very intelligent and erudite young man with a voracious appetite for literature. And he used to sneak some of his literary interests, references to them, into the lyrics of The Doors. And the song, Not to Touch the Earth, begins with the lyrics, Not to touch the earth, not to see the sun. And I believe those are the names of chapters from The Golden Bough. 
Yes, I'm looking at the chapter index, chapter 60, Between Heaven and Earth, section 1, Not to Touch the Earth, chapter 60, Between Heaven and Earth, section 2, Not to See the Sun. Nothing left to do but run, 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 let's run. But to get back on track, in writing this book, I was much assisted by Fraser's Golden Bough, and to a less extent by Jung's Psychology of the Unconscious. But my main assets were my intimate knowledge of the text of the Gospels, of the conditions of life and thought in the East, of the details of magical and mystical work, and of the literary conventions which old writers employed to convey their ideas. Crowley also had a kind of visionary experience during his stay in New Hampshire, which he referred to as the Star Sponge Vision. I lost consciousness of everything but a universal space, in which were innumerable bright points, and I realized this as a physical representation of the universe, in what I may call its essential structure. I exclaimed, nothingness with twinkles. I concentrated upon this vision, with the result that the void space which had been the principal element of it diminished in importance. Space appeared to be ablaze, yet the radiant points were not confused, and I thereupon completed my sentence with the exclamation, but what twinkles? Indeed, what does twinkle? In December, Crowley headed south, first to what was apparently his favorite American city, New Orleans, or New Orleans, and then to Titusville, Florida, where as awkward or entertaining or surreal as it might be to imagine, he spent time with evangelical relatives. Upon returning to New York, Crowley moved in with an artist friend by the name of Leon Engers Kennedy. Kennedy had joined Crowley's occult order, the AA, back in 1912. During this time, Kennedy produced an impressive portrait of Crowley in a kind of meditative or yogic pose that would go on to become the frontispiece for a volume of Crowley's publication, The Equinox, The Equinox Volume 3, Number 1 to be exact. Crowley himself had been experimenting with painting, and at one point hoping to attract potential models, he took out a newspaper ad that read, Wanted, dwarfs, hunchbacks, tattooed women, Harrison Fisher girls, freaks of all sorts, colored women, only if exceptionally ugly or deformed, to pose for artist, apply by letter with a photograph. I have to admit, I assumed a Harrison Fisher girl referred to someone with a certain kind of congenital deformity. But Harrison Fisher was a successful commercial artist from New York, known for his illustrations of attractive young women that grace magazine covers of the day, etc. It was around this same time in 1917 that Crowley also learned of the death of his mother. Crowley had had a strained and complicated relationship with his mother. She and Crowley's father were members of a Christian sector movement known as the Plymouth Brethren. Crowley's father, who he was fond of, died when he was young, and he resented the strict religious upbringing he was subjected to at the hands of his mother. She reportedly referred to him as the Beast, and according to Crowley, believed him to literally be the Antichrist. The following is from early on in the Confessions, where Crowley is describing how his father's death affected him, but he also comments on his mother's passing as well. On March 5, 1887, Edward Crowley died. The course of the disease had been practically painless. Only one point is of interest to our present purpose. On the night of March 5th, the boy away at school dreamed that his father was dead. There was no reason for this in the ordinary way, as the reports had been highly optimistic. The boy remembers that the quality of the dream was entirely different from anything he had known. The news of the death did not arrive in Cambridge till the following morning. The interest of this fact depends on a subsequent parallel. During the years that followed, the boy and the man dreamed repeatedly that his mother was dead, 
But on the day of her death, he, then three thousand miles away, had the same dream, save that it differed from the others, by possessing this peculiar, indescribable, but unmistakable quality that he remembered in connection with the death of his father. The pro-German paper, The Fatherland, for which Crowley had been writing, collapsed, but Varick kept Crowley on, and it was at this point that he appointed him editor of the International, which he used to try to promote Thelema, but the International soon failed as well. It's at this point that we come to the territory I covered in my last Crowley episode, the Amalantra working Lamb and Roddy Minor. Roddy Minor was a woman who was married yet separated, living away from her husband in a New York apartment on West 9th. She took up with Crowley, who made her his next scarlet woman, and nicknamed her the Camel. Minor, via drug-fueled visions, encountered a wizard figure supposedly named Amalantra, hence the Amalantra working which would also be the title of the book detailing the experience. It was also known as Book or Lieber 729 or 729. It was also during the Amalantra working that Crowley claimed to have encountered the entity known as Lamb, a being resembling, according to Crowley's own sketch, what people refer to as a gray alien. Crowley depicted Lamb as a diminutive being based on what we can see of the shoulders, with a large oversized balloon or teardrop-shaped head. The key difference I see between Crowley's depiction of Lamb and the classic image of a gray uh, that we find in popular culture are the eyes. Where greys are often depicted as having large, dark, almond-shaped eyes, Lambs are smaller and quite narrow. Crowley's lamb sketch would end up serving as the cover of the Amalantra working and also as the frontispiece of his commentary on Helena or Helena Blavatsky's book, The Voice of the Silence, in the aforementioned volume of the Equinox, Equinox Volume 3, Number 1, also known as the Blue Equinox. Despite gracing the cover of the Amalantra working, I can't find any actual mention of lamb in the text. But here's a portion from the confessions that I included in the Lamb episode. In it, Crowley describes his experience engaging with Roddy Minor, a.k.a. the Camel, and her drug-fueled visions. The Camel was a doctor of pharmacy employed in pathological analysis, and later in manufacturing perfumery. She had never had any interest in magic, or any similar study, and I had not attempted to rouse it. One weekend, she was lying on a mattress on the floor, smoking opium. The apparatus having been lent us by a famous chiropractor, who had bought it during a trip to Cuba, out of curiosity. I was sitting at my desk, working. To my surprised annoyance, the camel suddenly began to have visions. I shut off my hearing in the way I have learnt to do, but after some five minutes babbling, she pierced my defenses by some remark concerning an egg under a palm tree. This aroused me instantly, for the last instruction given to myself in Soror Vericum was to go to the desert and look for just that thing. And I should mention that Soror Vericum or Vericam was the magical alias or name given to an acquaintance of Crowley that he spent some time in New York with. Her actual name was Mary Desty. I think her maiden name was Mary Dempsey. I saw then a kind of continuity between those visions and these. It was as if the intelligence communicating were taking up the story at the point of which it had been dropped. Of course, it might have been a mere coincidence, but that point could be easily settled by cross-examination. I began to ask questions. The camel said that someone whom she called the wizard wished to communicate with me. I am not a spiritualist who accepts any message as of divine origin. I insist on knowing with whom I am talking, and on his showing such qualities of mind that the communication will benefit me. Now, as it happened, I had a test question to my hand. 
I had taken the name Baphomet as my motto in the OTO. For six years and more, I had tried to discover the proper way to spell this name. I knew that it must have eight letters, and also that the numerical and literal correspondences must be such as to express the meaning of the name in such a ways as to confirm what scholarship had found out about it, and also to clear up those problems which archaeologists had so far failed to solve. Here, then, was an ideal test of the integrity and capacity of the camel's wizard. I flung the question in his face. If you possess the superior knowledge which you claim, you can tell me how to spell Baphomet. The camel knew nothing of the Hebrew and little of the Greek. She had no idea that a conventional system existed by which one could check the accuracy of any given orthography. Her wizard answered my question without hesitation. Wrong, said I. There must be eight letters. True, he answered. There is an R at the end. The answer struck me in the midriff. One theory of the name is that it represents the words beta, alpha, phi, eta, mu, eta, tau, epsilon, omicron, sigma, the baptism of wisdom. Another that it is a corruption of a title meaning Father Mithras. Needless to say, the suffix R supported the latter theory. I added up the word as spelt by the wizard. It totaled 729. This number had never appeared in my cabalistic working, and therefore meant nothing to me. It however justified itself as being the cube of nine, the word Chi, Eta, Phi, Alpha, Sigma, the mystic title given by Christ to Peter as the cornerstone of the church, has this same value. So far the wizard had shown great qualities. He had cleared up the etymological problem and shown why the Templars should have given the name Baphomet to their so-called idol. Baphomet was Father Mithras, the cubical stone which was the corner of the temple. I therefore felt justified in concluding that the wizard really possessed sufficient intelligence to make it worth my while to listen to him. I hastily recorded the dialogue to that point. My next question inquired his name. He replied, Amalantra. I added this up. This time the result was conclusive. Its value is 729. Already he had shown me that I, in my office as Baphomet, was the rock on which the new temple should be built, and he now identified himself with me through his own name being of equivalent value. There was, however, so far no link between the order to which he belonged and the great order. 729 is not a significant number in the Kabbalah of Thelema. But when I asked him to assign a mystic name to the camel, he replied, Ahitha, which adds to 555, an obvious correlative with my own number in the great order, 666. It defined, so to speak, the function of the camel in that order. The following from the Confessions has Crowley describing the end of his relationship with Minor and embarking on yet another magical retreat or retirement. The idea was born and grew that she was essentially my inferior. She began to feel my personality as an obsession. She began to dread being dominated, though perfectly well aware that I wished nothing less, that her freedom was necessary to my enjoyment of my own. But she failed to rid herself of this hallucination, and when I decided to make a great magical retirement on the Hudson, in a canoe, in the summer of 1918, we agreed to part. There was no quarrel. Our friendship and even our intimacy continued. My last night in New York before leaving for Europe was spent in her arms. Such weekends as she could manage were passed by in my camp on Esopus Island, Esopus being an uninhabited, I believe, island in the middle of the Hudson River. 
During this period, Crowley also occupied himself, apparently, by painting Thelemic slogans on the riverside cliffs, as well as beginning an adaptation of the Eastern philosophical classic, the Tao Te Ching. He also wrote of past life memories, where he claimed to have been or at least experienced the memories of such grand or august figures as Xiao Zhen, a Taoist practitioner who lived during the Eastern Han dynasty, Pope Alexander VI, 18th century Italian occultist Alessandro Cagliostro, and Eliphas Levi, the 19th century French occultist who designed the famous Baphomet symbol, which I've discussed so much on the show. It was in the spring of 1918 when Crowley, then living in Greenwich Village, met Lea Hersig, a school teacher who, although being born in Switzerland, had been raised in the States and had attended high school in the Bronx. Both Leia and her older sister, Alma, already had an interest in the occult, which had led them to seek out Crowley. Leia Hersig and Crowley were immediately drawn to each other. When he asked her how he should paint her, she famously replied, Paint me as a dead soul. Crowley eventually consecrated her sig as his, you guessed it, Scarlet Woman. The Scarlet Woman in Crowley's occult or religious or spiritual system, Thelema, was the counterpart of his great beast persona and the living embodiment of the Thelemic or Thelemic goddess Babylon, spelled B-A-B-A-L-O-N. Babylon representing the female sexual impulse and the liberated woman. Hersig took the magical name Alostriel, the womb or grail of God. In the year 1921, she wrote the following passage in her diary. I dedicate myself wholly to the great work. I will work for wickedness. I will kill my heart. I will be shameless before all men. I will freely prostitute my body to all creatures. And disturbingly, that last sentence will come into play again later. Before finally returning to London after five years of dodging starvation, as he put it, in New York, Crowley spent mid-1919 climbing Montauk. Back home, deservedly or not, depending on where you believe Crowley's allegiance actually lay, he faced backlash for his perceived part in aiding the German war effort. A tabloid by the name of John Bull labeled him traitorous scum. Friends who seemed to believe he was actually working for British intelligence as a secret or double agent urged Crowley to sue, but he refused. Crowley had a history of breathing difficulty. He suffered from bronchitis and or asthma, and it was worsening. A physician prescribed heroin for the condition, and he quickly became addicted. The Beast moved to Paris and convinced Lea Hersig, who was still in America at the time, to come join him. Hersig had previously been married and had a two-year-old son but was now also pregnant with Crowley's child. During her ocean voyage to rendezvous with Crowley in France, she had befriended a nanny by the name of Nanette Shumway. It was decided that Shumway would become the nanny for her and Crowley's not-yet-born child. The three lived together, and within two months, Nanette was also pregnant by Crowley. He, Crowley, had decided he wanted to establish a Thelemite commune. After consulting the I Ching, he decided upon Cefalu, a small fishing village near Palermo, Sicily. They began renting an old villa, which Crowley dubbed the Abbey of Thelema. Life at the Abbey was marked by drug use, sex, and ritualistic magic. Crowley's heroin addiction was now dominating his life. Other drugs as well were taking their toll. Supposedly, his sinuses were being eroded by frequent cocaine use. The children of the Abbey were said to have been exposed to the libertine lifestyle and sex magic rituals of the adults, and wild cats and dogs reportedly wandered in and out of the building. And this is where the bit about Leia Hersig declaring that she would prostitute herself to all creatures comes into play again. At least this reminds me of that. 
Crowley had planned what arguably would have been his most degenerate act of sex magic ever. A he-goat would be encouraged to copulate with Leia Hersig, and at the moment it climaxed, its throat was to be slit. Luckily for everyone involved, apparently the goat didn't feel like cooperating. In the summer of 1920, Crowley's baby daughter by her sig, who she had nicknamed Poupée, fell ill. The child was taken to a hospital in Palermo, but died on October 12th, Crowley's 45th birthday. Hersig, who had been pregnant again, miscarried several days after Poupé's death. Eventually, the reputation of life at the Abbey, including the death of a young Thelemite by the name of Raoul Loveday, caught up with Crowley. He was ordered to be deported by none other than Benito Mussolini. Without Crowley, the Abbey eventually closed. By this time, Crowley had also burnt through inheritances left him by his mother and several aunts. Leah Hersig stayed loyal to him nonetheless, but the relationship became strained for both, and Crowley eventually broke it off, wasting little time finding a new scarlet woman by the name of Dorothy Olsen. Even after this, Hersig remained devoted to the quote-unquote great work, a term used in alchemy and the occult, in alchemy, it could be or at least be represented by the discovery of the Philosopher's Stone or achieving a union of opposites. In occult spirituality, it could be attaining ultimate enlightenment, achieving union with the divine or absolute, discovering or liberating one's true or higher self, the emancipation of the will, or a reference to the ongoing process of spiritual growth. Growth. But to continue, she remained devoted to the great work, the practice of magic, and the promulgation of Thelema. She consecrated herself as the Bride of Chaos. In 1925, Crowley asked her to return to serve as a scribe and secretary, and she readily accepted. Back during their days at the Abbey of Thelema, Crowley once wrote of her, She loves me for my work. She knows and loves the God in me, not the man, and therefore she has conquered the great enemy that hides behind his clouds of poisonous gas. Illusion. Hersig herself also faced a period of economic hardship. There's contention among biographers whether or not this ever drove her to resort to prostitution. She would eventually remarry and have a son, as well as resume working as a teacher back in America. Despite her harrowing life of misadventure with Crowley, she went on to live to a ripe old age, dying at 91 in Meiringen, Switzerland in 1975. I believe it's never been definitively confirmed, but it has been rumored that at some point she had converted to Roman Catholicism. I debated covering Cefalu in the Abbey of Thelema in this episode, as my intention was to stay focused on Crowley's time in New York, but it seemed appropriate to at least close out Leah Hersig's story as she and Crowley had first met in New York. I hope you enjoyed this special documentary episode of The Week in Doubt, and as always, thanks for listening.